Almost it is 1812. Uh -oh. The French are invading Russia, and it's a little ambiguous as to where the hell the French are going as well as Napoleon the Tricky, right? So they're, the Russians are kind of cover all their best. It's Wednesday night in the Twin Cities. David Wesley is giving the Russian team a pregame briefing. The main event at Wesley's house is wargaming with Napoleonic miniatures. It's only much later that I realized how different the Twin Cities was to gaming compared to anywhere else in the world, let alone the United States. These are the gamers that Dave Arneson spent his entire life with. Over 1,000 miniatures are laid out on the table. David Wesley's French army is pitted against Dave Arneson's collection of Russian figures. In a sense, Dave Arneson is still with them. 10 or 15 years ago, I, I still went back and planned out how I would start the Spanish Empire off again in that campaign, what I would do, I'll, right down to writing the budget. History has a way of making people and events larger than life. If you trace the history of the role-playing game, you find that it begins in the fall of 1963, when Ray Allard decides to form a club in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. The purpose of the club is to bring together a bunch of people who have a shared interest in military history, model building, and miniature collecting. A lot of the guys they all were in college together, and they all got to be th this group that liked playing these role-playing games. So that's how they all became friends and got together and started doing these things. Well, it's got a formal name, but we never used it. Midwest Military Simulations Association, MMSA. It even had its own little broadside, if you will, the corner of the table. Seven people attend the first meeting, Hidden within this small group are three college students who are interested in war games. David Wesley is one of these young war gamers. We've worked out now that we may have had the biggest war gaming group in the world. I mean, outside of conceivably saying the US Army War College is a war gaming group, but the biggest hobby war gaming group in the world. We didn't realize that. We thought that Avalon Hill must be this giant factory building somewhere that's cranking out all these games and is filled with these brilliant people who design them. We didn't know that in those days, Avalon Hill had a staff of two people and were in one office in the corner of a great big warehouse that was owned by the printing company that had bought up Avalon Hill when it went bankrupt. It's difficult for us to think of pre-D&D. It, it's all just a natural progression. And it always has been, right up to the present. Their biggest concern is making the games more enjoyable and having fun with their friends. These gamers have no idea that they will change the face of their hobby forever. Although these gamers may not be the first to explore these ideas, their group will take their role-playing methods farther than anyone. Over the next 10 years, they will go from strict wargaming, which is like a game of chess played with lead soldiers, to games of pure imagination. Within the first two years, we didn't know what the hell to call this. We finally ended up arguing. We first called it fantasy roleplay. It wasn't even a game significant around it. We we're still arguing about it. Is it a game? Uh, but to this day, people can still argue. It. My point of view is that it incorporates part of game theory into it, play theory throw it together, comes its own system, finding itself with its own conceptual apparatus, so you can call it anything you want. The original set includes three booklets with many complex rules. By comparison with parlor games, such as Monopoly, the rules are very extensive. Yet the core concept of the game is only covered on two pages by a brief example of how the game is played. Every role-playing game published after Dungeons & Dragons follows the same format lots of rules, and a small example of how the game is played. This play method can't be copyrighted or patented under our laws. And one of the things that I find most telling about it is that that continues to be how they do it. That you just can't seem to describe the game by just writing down all the rules. You actually have to have somebody talk you through what it looks like when people are playing it so they can get a feel for the social interaction on a level that's very hard to describe as just simple, flat statements. 
What is even more confounding about the playstyle is that you can play a role-playing game without any rules at all. But you can't play a role-playing game without the play method that is employed by all of these games. So how do these games come into existence? And what is the relationship between wargaming, games with many rules and no role-playing, and the games that rely entirely on role-playing? If you ask the Twin Cities gamers how it all happened, they will all tell you the same thing. It begins with the discovery of a very old text on wargaming. At Hamley University, there was nothing if you looked at war games. But at the University of Minnesota, which is a really big school, you found Strategos, the American Game of War by Charles Nadia Lewis Totten, was in their card catalog. So you went down and you got the book out, and you were astonished at the 340 pages of rules when Avalon Hill Games' top was 16. When Dan Nicholson moves to Minnesota in 1964, he is already a war gamer. But he doesn't know any other war gamers in the Twin Cities. Dan went through the U of M library. This is really dating us. The cards that are in the, were in the back of the book that you signed when you signed out a book. He got one or two of those books that had a military nature to them. He had the inspiration of looking at who checked it out in the last five years on the assumption that if it's more than five years, they're probably not here anymore. And he called up the people. He looked them up in the phone book and called them. And there were three of us. So he show, he got in touch with me. I invited him to come to a meeting. He came from the meeting. He said, there's two more guys I think we ought to meet. So he went and saw one of them, and I went and saw the other one, and those two guys joined the group too. It is prophetic that these war gamers have one thing in common. Each of them has gone to the U of M library and independently discovered Strategos. Those who read Strategos will gain a certain status in the group. They have a deeper understanding of the game and will become the referees or game masters for the battles. They will also take part in reinterpreting the rules. They were playing with Jack Scruby figures. Jack Scruby was, a, at that time, a US manufacturer of relatively crude figures. And yeah, they had already started playing around with Napoleonics. The next group of gamers to join the club is a group of teenagers. David Wesley still remembers his first meeting with these younger guys. The Avalon Hill Journal, which was published to promote the sale of their war games, had an opponent's wanted column in the back. So a look in there, and we discovered that in St. Paul, there was some kid named Arneson who was advertising he was looking for opponents. I called him and I said, I saw your ad in the general. Oh, good, he said, yeah, you want to get together with us or going to get together next Saturday? And so I said, fine, you know, one o'clock on Saturday afternoon is great. So I hopped in my car and I drove over and I walked up the front steps to Arneson's house. His mother's there. I said, I'm here to see David. And he says, oh, all right, well, the boys are downstairs. So she sent me down the stairs into their basement and there are Four guys, as I recall, if there were four guys, gathered around the Arneson's ping pong table, and they've got some Avalon Hill game spread out in it. And there were introductions all around. And I could probably guess at who the people were, but honestly, I don't remember which people of Arneson's circle of friends I met that first time. I met Arneson. David Arneson is only 16 years old when he and David Wesley first meet. Neither can know that together they will invent a new type of game nor do they know that this meeting will lead to many friendships that will last a lifetime. The next time I was there, Dave Arneson had joined the group, and he was still in high school at that point. And, um, but he was very enthusiastic, and his, he was an only child, and his dad had a very good paying job. So Dave had money, and being only in high school, Dave had time. And so he painted up quite a few figures. I mean, he'd been in the group for, I think, six months, and he had the biggest army in the bunch already. They met in the basement of our house on Hartford Avenue in St. Paul. And they would, they'd, they'd start gathering about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and they'd go until four or five o'clock in the morning. I don't know when they would quit but they'd be arguing and yelling at each other and whatnot. They went on all night. And uh, I had no idea what they were talking about. 
It was way over my head.